Hi there, Smart Drivers, talking to you tonight about night driving. As one smart driver said some years ago, it's like driving on another planet. And that is very true in terms of driving at night. The reason for that is because our ability to see is reduced by half. We're talking about night driving, uh, tips, skills, and strategies to be safer at night and to be more comfortable and more confident at night. Driving at night for many people is intimidating. And one of the first things that senior drivers do as they get older and begin to age is they avoid driving at night. And many people will avoid driving at night because they find it so intimidating. As I mentioned in the introduction, one smart driver years ago said it's like driving on a different planet. And it very much is like driving on a different planet because you cannot see the landscape in which you're driving. And uh, Tim just added here that uh, Britain has a lot of speed cameras as well. So that has an impact on how fast the traffic flow is in those countries that have a lot of speed cameras. So driving at night is intimidating. Driving in fog is intimidating. Driving in snow and blowing uh, blizzard-like conditions can be very intimidating for people. But if we give you a few tips and strategies here, that is going to help you out to be safer at night. And the other thing about intimidating at night, Highway 97 here between Vernon, British Columbia, where I live, and Kelowna, which is about 35 minutes south, at night in the winter time, that road is intimidating even to me as a veteran driver because you just can't see. There's very few uh, overhead street lamps. The environmental paint that they're now using on the roads is not as reflective as it once was. Uh, it used to have shards of glass in it to reflect the light off of road markings. The Whatever the types of reflectors that they're using down the middle of the road to demarcate the concrete barriers and the edges of the roads are not as reflective. Uh, years ago, I can remember driving truck, those reflectors uh, on some interstates and freeways and highways, you could see a good half a mile down the road with your headlights because they were reflecting off these reflectors. Uh, and these reflectors, I find now that you can only see three or four reflectors ahead. So it's not as Vis uh, they're not as visible as they once were because of the paint that we used to use because we've gone to all this environmental stuff. But I question the environmental use of these paints that you're using for highways and whatnot because A, they're not as visible and B, we're repainting them every year. So if we're repainting them every year, are they more environmental? I don't think so. Uh, Tim says driving night in the rain is the worst for me. And uh, Tim, I think that a lot of people would say the same that driving at night with the rain is one of the hardest driving conditions to be in because of the reflection of the light off the water that's sitting on the roadway which makes it incredibly difficult on your eyes and fatigue and you're driving at night and those types of things so yes it is difficult uh night driving silhouettes where is the curve of the road fewer lights and if there are fewer lights definitely slow down at night uh, you're looking for any landmarks and probably the best landmark is other traffic on the roadway because we hope for the most part that other traffic on the roadway is going to drive on the road right so as i mentioned in the introduction and earlier the farther you get away from city landscapes with overhead street lights city buildings signs those types of things the more you're going to have to rely on your headlights of your car and you'll find out that unless you're driving a newer model car or if you've replaced out your headlights for newer uh, Nighthawks or those types of high caliber lights that it's going to be difficult for you to see at night with your uh, headlights. You're going to rely more on looking for landmarks in the lot in the landscape rather. Fatigue management, get some sleep. If you're driving in the early morning, two, three o'clock in the morning, make sure that you get sleep. Have a nap if you have to. And I'm going to show you one of the fatigue commercials from Australia. Australia is really big on uh, driving and fatigue. So uh, get a nap, get 10 minute power nap, pull over in the side of the, uh, in, into a rest area or some other place, lock your doors, keep yourself safe and get a power nap. I used to do this a lot when I was driving truck. I would stop, get 20 minutes, half an hour of sleep, and then I would carry on with my driving. 
uh, eating. You can eat carrots or rice cakes or something else, whatever works for you. Uh, for me, it was carrots and rice cakes when I was driving at night. That will help you stay awake too if you're absolutely pressed that you do have to drive at night when you're tired. Uh, have a look at the video on fatigue management and this will give you some, uh, some further tips and skills and strategies to be able to drive at night and drive safely. Now, driving at sunset and sunrise are going to be your most difficult times to be driving at. Mostly, not so much at sun, sunrise, but more so at sunset because the light, the sun is going to be right on the horizon. And if you're driving into the sun, it's going to be glaring. So wear quality sunglasses, put your sun visor down, and again, look for signs, landmarks along the roadway, look for other traffic that you can follow that's going to help you out to, to find out where the road is because this is the key to being able to drive at night confidently or driving in bad weather is knowing where the road is. I would put forth a professional opinion that 80% of the challenges for drivers driving in inclement weather or driving at night is simply locating the road. Look at the traffic signs. The traffic signs are going to give you information about whether it curves to the left, whether it curves to the right. Look as far down the road as you can see for looking at other traffic, because as I said, other traffic is going to stay on the roadway. Look for reflections, look for any houses along the roadway that are lit up. Uh, look for cross traffic for intersections in front of you uh, and uh, trees, breaks in the tops of the trees. If you're driving through a wooded area and whatnot, all of this is going to help you out with driving at night. And the other thing about sunset and sunrise, the other point that I'll make is, is that things are going to hide in the darkness because you have a light sky and a dark landscape and cyclists and other road users are going to hide in that darkness and because your eyes are adjusted to the light sky. They're not adjusted to the darkness of the roadway. Dash lights at night, turn your dash lights down as far as you can stand. The glare or the reflection of the lights off the dash is going to cause your eyes to fatigue because it's gonna drag your eyes down to the dashboard because it's so bright. You want to have your night vision. Your, you want your pupils to actually dilate and get bigger so that they can see into the darkness. And if you have your dash lights turned up as bright as you can, and we know that many of these newer vehicles, and I put a new stereo in my vehicle in the buggy, and it's got these blue lights on it, and I just absolutely hate the blue lights on the new stereo because they cause my eyes to be dragged to that light all the time because our eyes are attracted to light and movement and try to turn your dash lights down as much as you can stand and that way it's going to reduce fatigue when you're driving at night. Farther away from urbanite, urban areas, the more you're gonna rely on your headlights, you're gonna to have to slow down as much as possible. Use your high beams and if you can, if there's other vehicles approaching, make sure that you turn your high beams down or turn them off to low beams so that you're not blinding drivers of other uh, vehicles and again we had this question before that other drivers won't turn down their high beams if you have a driver that's doing that or you find that the lights from the oncoming cars and traffic are exceptionally bright look to the outer edge of the roadway so that you can preserve your night vision when driving in the dark houses along the roadway are some of the landmarks uh, lights to mark the road intersections look for cross traffic follow the traffic traffic signs at night are reflective so they're going to act as landmarks because know that most road signs are going to be placed near the roadway, not on the roadway, but at near the edge of the roadway. So that's going to help you as well. Utility poles are, as well are going to help you to locate the roadways because the utility poles for the most part are going to be lo located along the roadway. So look for all of those landmarks. You can see in this image here that you have a break through the trees at the top and that will indicate the, where the roadway is going, uh, the curve of the road, and if there's fewer lights or you're just re relying a lot on your headlights, then slow down and reduce your speed uh, until you're comfortable and get more comfortable with driving at night because it is definitely a skill that uh, you need to practice like any other aspect of driving. Uh, if you're driving on highways for long distances at night, use cruise control. This will allow you to turn your dash lights down 
when I used to drive truck, I used to turn my dash lights almost all the way off. Uh, Multi-lane highways, uh, stay in the right lane, especially if you're driving near or at the posted speed limit. And if you're passing, uh, make sure that you get lots of distance in front of the vehicle that you're passing until you get back in. We had a question about this earlier and I'll talk about this uh, when I'll just finish up the presentation here and then we'll talk about that. Good luck on your road test and remember, pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. Uh, Theo, I'm experienced uh, the fog difficulty two evenings ago. I'm a new older driver and yes, fog can be quite intimidating especially if you're on the east coast, uh, the eastern seaboard of the United States where they have, there's two kinds of fogs and maybe one of the smart drivers can distinguish between advection fog and confection fog. Uh, one of them is sea fog. And I can remember the first time that I encountered sea fog. I was cycling in Newfoundland. I used to do some big cycling tours and uh, sea fog, it can be windy and blowing a gale and you can't see your hand in front of your face from fog. It's very disconcerting for those of us who are from, you know, the interior in the Midwest and those types of things. We get out to the coast, the Atlantic coast, and you get this sea fog where it's blowing a gale and you can't see your hand in front of your face. That's, that's very new <laughs> for those of us that uh, don't know that or haven't experienced that kind of fog before. Uh, Coconut Head passed my G in Brampton, Ontario last week, uh, but Rick's live streams are hard to pass up. Uh, Coconut Head, that is absolutely incredible that you passed your license there in Brampton last week. Congratulations. And what did you do and go and celebrate, my friend? That is awesome. Uh, Sean is tuning in from Brooklyn Park, Minnesota. Great state there. Aaron is tuning in from Chilliwack, BC. Thank you so much. It just passed my unrestricted class four. And that is great. Uh, for those of you who don't know, class four unrestricted is small bus, uh, less than 25 passengers, including the driver. And usually it's like ambulance, uh, you know, seniors homes, those types of things, churches and whatnot. And uh, that is really awesome. Uh, Tim says uh, fog is scary, but for being hit from behind for those who don't slow down indeed and we're going to give you some strategies about that just remind me about that as well Tim and I'll talk about that because we all have seen the video footage of those foggy freeways where there's a huge pile up you know 100 160 car pile up on the freeway because it's foggy and one car piles into the back of another car and another car and it just you know domino effects out on the freeway uh, elevator fan I had I have had drivers approach me with their high beams on and not turn them off. And yes, that is frustrating. A lot of drivers get tired at night and forget to turn off their high beam headlights when they're going past other vehicles. Some of the new vehicles, even if they do turn off their high beam headlights and have their low beams on, they're so bright that it is still difficult to be able to see. And I'll give you a strategy. You can basically look down at the fog line. So you look to the outside of the edge of the road and look away. You don't want to look into that light because you want to preserve your night vision. And Corey will put up the video on night driving and it'll give you more information about that as well. Uh, Al Mallory says, it's my birthday coming up this Friday. Well, happy birthday, Mallory. If I forget to wish you happy birthday on Friday, that is absolutely awesome. One year older. Indeed, my friend. Uh, Jasmine was in fog this morning, but my best boyfriend was driving. And yes, that makes it a little bit easier. But like, as I said, the tips, strategies that we're going to use for night driving will help you in inclement weather as well. Fog, snowstorms, those types of things. All these skills and strategies that you're going to learn for night driving will help you for that as well. And Elevator says that it was foggy in Monticello, Indiana this morning. He's in the Midwest there, and Corey's put up the video on night driving. So that is all really great. And one of the other things I'm going to try to do this week in terms of the live stream, I'm going to pick on social media a little bit. I've found a few clips and things that I want to show you and kind of have a commentary on and talk about some winter driving. And for those of you who are heading up to a road test, Book your road test in the winter time. It is easier to pass your driver's test in the winter time. I know that there are all these people freaking out, postponing their driver's test until next spring and whatnot, but don't postpone your driver's test. It's going to be easier to get a driver's test because all of the DMVs are backed up due to post-pandemic world in which we now live and they're trying to play catch up. 
A lot of people are postponing their driver's test until next spring, so make sure that you take a driver's test in the winter time. Most vehicles in this day and age are all front wheel drive, all wheel drive, four wheel drive. So the car is going to be fine as long as you have good quality tires on your vehicle. You're not gonna slip and slide around. The driving test in the winter time is less exact. You don't have to be eight to 12 inches from the, from the curb when you're parallel parking. You just have to be um, in be, behind the vehicle in front of you. You don't have to stop at the correct stopping position at the intersection if there's snow banks piled up. Just stop before the sidewalk. Make sure the way is clear. Give way to all other road users. Creep out until you can see when the way is clear, then you proceed. Uh, backing into a parking lot. You don't have to get in be between the lines. So I strongly encourage you take your driver's test in the winter time don't wait until next spring you can get your driver's test in the winter time as well driving examiners aren't as stressed out they don't have as many tests because a lot of people have postponed their tests as i've already said so take your test in the winter time and they're a bit more chill they're a bit more they're going to give you some discretion uh they're going to exact use their discretion rather and they're going to be they're going to give you kudos because you took your driver's test in the winter time so do that all right and corey's put up the video the full video on why you should take your driver's test in the winter time so do that book your driver's test and practice and get your driver's test now so the question i had right at the beginning from one of the smart drivers was they made a lane change on a highway at night and it was dark and they couldn't see the other vehicle and they started to merge over and then checked again before they moved over which was great that they did that because at the last minute they saw the other vehicle when you're driving at night and your visibility or your vision is limited because of the darkness you need to communicate more effectively at night it becomes even more important so three flashes minimum on your signal before you start moving the vehicle over shoulder check twice that way you're going to be able to identify and find these other vehicles because they can come up all of a sudden uh, with their lights and those types of things. But flashing lights are going to be much more noticeable at night. So make sure that you have your, your signal on, you're communicating effectively before you move the vehicle. Because remember, <laughs> signals are to request that you want to move over, not that you are moving over, as too many people do when they're signaling. They're, you know, they're already moving over, and they just put their signal on, kind of, kind of as a courtesy. <coughs> so signal lots before moving the vehicle, and that way it's going to keep you safe when you're driving at night. Uh, Tim says uh, twilight is bad as your eyes are transitioning between rods and cones. Neither is fully functioning, and that is absolutely true. We have limitations in our biology, limitations in our ability to see, and unfortunately for Tim and I and other people who are older, uh, our eyes don't work as well. So <laughs> that's going to happen at night. So you need to put in these other techniques and skills and strategies that are going to keep you safe at night. Uh, Richie the Wolf, thank you so much for the super chat, my friend. That is awesome. Uh, if a driver wants to turn on a left lane on a red light with other cars way before an ambulance far behind wants to make a left turn, can the driver get in trouble for not pulling on the right? Uh, no, Richie, if there is an emergency vehicle and you're at an intersection, as long as you pull to one of the shoulders, it doesn't have to be pulling to the right. You can pull to the left as well for an emergency vehicle to get around you. Now, if you're at an intersection, sometimes the best thing is to just stop because for those we're on the right side of the road, all of the traffic stopped at the intersection. This traffic is on the other side of the intersection for the, you know, coming through the intersection. The emergency vehicle is just going to go out into the left-hand lane, move through the intersection and then proceed. So that's what you need to do uh, if you're at an intersection and an emergency vehicle approaches the intersection. So great question there. Uh, Sebastian, I've had drivers turn their high beams on at me and this reminded me to turn off my high beams. Uh, yes, sometimes drivers will do that. I don't recommend that you do that, that you, you know, drivers are coming towards you and they're not turning down their high beams, they're not turning down their high beams because I've done that as well. I'm guilty of doing that where I'll flash my high beams to tell the other person to turn down their high beams because we get tired at night we forget that they're on those types of things we're all human right and sometimes it's not even their high beams it's just that their low beams are so bright 
<laughs> that they'll flash their lights back to show you that in fact they are on their low beams. So I don't really encourage that, but that happens. And as well, Sebastian, for those of you driving truck, <clears throat> for those of you who are getting passed on highways and freeways by semi trucks, uh, one of the things you can do in the daytime is you can flash your high beams to tell the big truck that they're passed and they can pull back in front of you. Now at night, you don't want to do that because the, the big, the, the truck driver is sitting in the truck driving the truck and they're looking they're in the passing lane and they're looking in the mirror they're looking in the mirror and then at night you flash the lights and they're like oh my god it just like nails them right so if they if you're driving at night and a semi truck passes you and you want you want to be courteous and tell them to move back and turn your lights off and then turn your lights back on a couple of times and that way you're not going to blind them because they're looking in the mirror trying to figure out whether they're past you and uh it is a courtesy for sure but try not to blind them uh, when they're looking in the mirror there. Uh, elevator, don't use high beams when it is foggy because it will make things worse. And elevator is absolutely true for the new drivers out there. You're going to figure this out pretty quickly that in snow and in fog, you want to use your low beam headlights. And this is the other reason they put fog lights on cars. And a lot of modern up upscale vehicles are going to have fog lights on them. Fog lights are placed low to the ground. And the reason for that is because the light goes down underneath. Now, when you turn your high beams on, uh, fog is just water droplets, clouds in the air. And snow, you turn your high beams on, it looks like, <laughs> you know, going into hyperspace or hyperdrive from Star Wars where it's just, that's all coming at you. You can't see anything with your high beams on when it's snowing or uh, in fog, as Elevator said. So, yes, use your low beams. Uh, in inclement weather, that's what you need to do to be able to see uh, see well and to drive safely. Uh, Mallory says, make sure that all of your vehicle lights are working order before driving at night. Yes, do a pre-trip inspection on your vehicle. Make sure that all your high beams and your low beams are working because if your high beams are out, <laughs> the low beam's still going to work. So make sure that you check both equally because I did that years ago and I had a low beam headlight out and uh, but I had four, an old vehicle that had four four lights, right? <laughs> and so the low beam was out, and the other low beam was out, and I thought, well, I could just turn the high beams on because there's four light four bulbs there, and then I'll just have low beams. It doesn't work like that. <laughs> so check your low beams and your headlights separately, and check all your parking lights and make sure that everything is working, especially now that we're going into winter time and ensure that you look uh, at the car care video here uh, and get your vehicle up to speed and make sure that everything is good for the winter time. Make sure that you have winter windshield washer fluid uh, in your vehicle because if you just put water in it or you have uh, summer windshield washer fluid and it will freeze, that reservoir is plastic and as we know, when water freezes, it expands, it will crack that plastic reservoir. So make sure that it is winter washer fluid in there so that you don't damage that because it's an expensive repair if you damage that reservoir. As well, your radiator, make sure your radiator fluid is at the correct temperature, uh, you know, minus 40 for the winter time. And uh, carry a few small, uh, fierce uh, light bulbs there, as Tim says. If you can wield a screwdriver, it's very easy to change a uh, headlight. It's very easy. Well, it depends what kind of vehicle you have. If you have a Honda CRV that I have, it's very easy to change the headlight. It takes like five minutes. Uh, change the taillights, just pull the thing out, change the bulb, and those types of things. I mean, if you have a Chevy Impala, uh, some years ago I looked up, I was going to do a video on how to change headlights, and then I realized that Chevy Impalas are crazy hard to change the headlights. You need an automotive technician to be able to do that. Uh, but you know for most vehicles for most of us if you can wield a screwdriver uh, You can change the lights on your vehicle and save yourself a bit of money uh, Elevator view being to Monticello, Indiana. It's such a great place in the Midwest uh, I haven't been to Monticello, but I'll put that on my list of places to go for sure uh, elevator uh, Mostly Fort Wayne, Indiana and the other place that I worked out of actually was where uh, Burlington Motor Carriers was was uh, situated in Daleville, Indiana, and I worked out of there for a while. So I uh, have been to the Midwest, have been to Indiana, love Indiana, it's a great state. Thea, uh, I have to ask my son to Google which beam to use 
uh, during my crazy fog experience. I could not remember which one was correct, and I was driving, so I remembered as soon as you said it. And yes, the uh, low beams for fog and uh, snow, if you got snow coming down, you want to be using your low beam headlights as opposed to your high beam headlights. And it's not hard to remember <laughs> because if you turn your high beams on, you can't see anything because it's just reflecting off the fog and you just get this <laughs> blur in front of the windshield. So yeah, low beam headlights. Uh, Wyatt, they sell a coolant checker bulb uh, for like $4 at Walmart. Yes, they're very inexpensive to be able to check your radiator fluid. And the other piece is, you know, take your vehicle into an auto mechanic, an uh, automotive technician. They're not called mechanics anymore, automotive technicians. I always get in trouble with my brother when I go there and hang out in the summertime. <laughs> so, uh, yes, and just get it checked over and make sure that your tire's good. Put your winter tires on and whatnot. You know, make sure if you don't have winter tires, make sure you have good quality all seasons on your vehicle. And, uh, you know, because most of us are driving front wheel drive, all wheel drive, or four wheel drive vehicles, it's very, it's rare in this day and age to be driving a rear wheel drive vehicle. Now, I know that Tim has an old Tacoma and he has a rear wheel drive vehicle. <laughs> two-wheel drive rear-wheel drive but those are rare now that's the exception uh, to most vehicles as I said most vehicles are not two-wheel drive rear-wheel drive those are a bit challenging to drive in the winter time for sure uh, Wyatt remember it's the low beams reflecting to your bumper and the high beams reflecting to your eyes awesome uh, Thea says she won't forget again thank you so much and you are most welcome uh, so we talked about taking your driving test in the winter time because it's easier uh, as well. Head over to the Smart Drive Test website. You can pick up the Smarter Driver course package uh, and we include both the defensive driving and winter driving smart courses. You can pick that up for about $37.95 and guaranteed to pass your driver's test first time. So have a look at that. Tim says he carries chains too. Well, Tim, if you're driving two wheel drive, rear, rear wheel drive, uh, I would definitely have chains in my vehicle, uh, especially there on Vancouver Island. And this is the other piece about driving in the winter time that a lot of people don't realize. It's more treacherous to drive when the temperature is around freezing, zero degrees Celsius or 32 degrees Fahrenheit, because there's a layer of water on top of the snow and ice and that lubricates it. As opposed to minus 20, the ice is and the snow is sticky. So it's easier to drive when it's like super cold as opposed to when the, uh, you know, at the, at the base of the Rocky Mountains up and down in Oregon and Washington State and places like that, you're going to get this wet, heavy snow that's really slick and really tough to drive in because of that layer of water on top of the ice and snow that's lubricating it. So know that, take note of the temperature. And I know that all of the radio stations and social media are all saying when it's minus 20 degrees out or it's minus five degrees Fahrenheit and they're all saying, oh my God, it's so cold, it's so treacherous, there's so many cars in the, in the ditch and we're all gonna die. It, they really should be saying that when the temperature is around freezing because it's much more treacherous. And the other piece is you're going to get ice on the roadways, not you know the proverbial black ice, which I don't agree with, it's just ice on the roadways. Uh, and we're going to get that in low-lying areas, high elevations, uh, any place where the road lies in shadow, bridges and overpasses, and any place where the road runs along, uh, you know, near bodies of water, you're going to get ice on the roadways. And especially in the morning when there hasn't been much traffic on the roadway. So know that when you're driving and look out for ice. Tim, have a great uh, dinner, my friend. All the best, and we will see you next week. All the best. Uh, packed wet snow is miserable, and yes it is, especially there on Vancouver Island, it is absolutely treacherous. Uh, Sebastian, Monticello, Indiana is a very pretty place, Rick. I second the recommendation, you feel like you entered a time machine. Awesome, awesome, I look forward to heading down that way. Uh, Colton, automotive technicians, sounds like somebody who works at a factory or a dealership. <laughs> Mechanic is someone who works in a shop. That is not part of a dealership or does it at home. Uh, yeah, Colton, it's it's kind of a tough term to kind of get your head around for sure, uh, calling them automotive technicians. So, uh, Elevator, there is a snow belt in Cleveland, Ohio. And yes, Cleveland, Ohio is not just the only place where there's a snow belt elevator. Uh, there's also a snow belt in Buffalo, New York, and places near the Great Lakes that get the lake effect. Uh, my mom lives in Wingham, Ontario, and they get the lake effect off Lake Huron. 
and just incredible amounts of snow in the winter time. So there are places that you're going to get the lake effect, you're going to get the uh, Atlantic Ocean effect, and all of that is going to affect your weather patterns, as we know, with hurricanes and the Gulf of Mexico and the warm currents in the Atlantic Ocean and those types of things. So yes, there are definitely places in the winter time where the Great Lakes and the oceans affect how much snow these places get in the winter time and again how much ice and snow they get on the roadways as well and then you'll get places in the Midwest and on the prairies and whatnot where you get these blowing snow and blizzards they don't get a great deal of snow but they just get a lot of wind that drives the snow and they get snow banks along the roadways and those types of things and a lot of places you'll see the snow fences up that will stop the snow from building up on the roadways uh, and uh, that's just something I haven't seen for a long time because I mean we live in the mountains now but when I lived in Ontario I used to see a lot of snow fences to prevent uh, snow from piling up on the roadways or other places where you didn't want it you know dumping it on the farmers driveway and whatnot so they would put up a snow fence to prevent that uh, you see them along beaches it's the same thing where the wind blows the sand and you get sand dunes and whatnot uh, similar effect uh, with weather and whatnot uh, why a part of turning your lights on during fog is a game changer for making your vehicle visible to others, especially the red taillights. And yes, uh, Wyatt, that is absolutely uh, spot on advice for drivers driving in rain, driving at night, driving in fog, driving in snow, any type of inclement weather. Turn your lights on so that you are more visible to other vehicles and you can keep yourself safe in the winter time and driving at night and whatnot. Uh, Joe, worst night drive was during a total whiteout type snowstorm on Highway 9 west of Arthur, Ontario. When I got to the truck stop at Tiviotdale, I crashed there till dawn. And yes, you get some of those driving situations and conditions where the road is just, it's undrivable. And it's better to just get to someplace safe where you can park your vehicle, uh, just pull over and stop, lock the doors and wait until morning uh, because it's just too treacherous and you shouldn't be driving. It's just easier to wait it out. Uh, Rena, I drive at night in some areas, there's no lights, so really hard to see. I end up uh, putting my high beams on, is that a good idea? Uh, Rena, yes, absolutely. If you can't see and there aren't, isn't other traffic that's going to preclude or stop you from putting on your high beams, then definitely use your high beams. And for those of you who are doing a lot of night driving, you might want to consider changing out your headlights so that you have better visibility. Because I know that there are some high quality headlights uh, over on Amazon, Nighthawks, and those types of things that will give you, you know, more light at night. I know the old Honda, uh, the buggy, doesn't have a great deal of light at night when I get away from the cities and whatnot and you know when I change out the lights next time I'm probably going to upgrade to high, to better quality headlights so I can get a bit more light out of it at night and whatnot. <clears throat> uh, D, full headlights, best right now because of daylight changing and yes this weekend uh, for those of us not in Indiana, not in Saskatchewan, Ontario, or Saskatchewan Canada rather, uh, we're not, they're not changing to daylight savings, but those of us who do adhere to daylight savings, we're changing to daylight savings this weekend, so know that that's coming as well. Uh, Rena, you're most welcome, my friend. Uh, <laughs> Colton, fancy names. Yes, can we just keep it simple? I, Colton, I completely agree. You know, can we just keep it simple? They're just called mechanics. Let's just keep it simple. Uh, D says, uh, Barry Aurelia has a bad for snow belts as well. Uh, <laughs> uh, Corey, my brother just says that to me all the time that they're called automotive technicians. I don't know. I don't know. I'm sure if you just say mechanic, I'm sure everybody still knows what you're talking about for sure. <laughs> Uh, Colton, if people think a car on ice is bad, try an 18-wheeler with a heavy load. Uh, actually, uh, Colton, I would rather drive a semi-truck with a load on in bad weather than I would drive my personal vehicle. I feel more comfortable in a semi-truck in bad weather that's loaded, not empty, but loaded, than I do in my own vehicle. I just feel you have a lot more traction with a big truck. Uh, Joe, the, those super bright blue-white LED headlights are a step backwards in safety terms, in my opinion. If you're at a red light and a truck behind you has them on, uh, you could be seeing spots for a minute after. And yes, I completely agree with what you're saying, Joe. Uh, some of those newer vehicles that have those crazy, crazy bright lights, 
uh, yes, they're super bright and really affect your night vision for sure. And the other piece that I just wanted to mention that Joe just reminded me of, uh, if you do have vehicles behind you and the lights are reflecting in and reflect, especially off that center mirror, it's, it's adjusted so the light is going to reflect into your eyes. There's a tab on the bottom of the mirror that you can change the mirror. You can still see out the back window, but it's going to stop the reflection of the car's headlights behind you being shot right into your eyes. So make sure you flip that tab on the bottom of the center mirror to preserve your night vision when you're driving in the dark and inclement weather and those types of things. Uh, Lewis, what's the true story behind people reporting there's only 25 days of diesel left? Uh, Lewis, I hadn't heard that. I would be interested in hearing about that story that there's only 25 days of diesel. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I haven't heard that yet. Uh, Colton, I'm going to roll out. Want to get some sleep. See you next time. Uh, Colton, all the best, my friend. Thanks for stopping by and have a great night. Uh, D, D, even on dull overcast days, I put on my full headlights on automatic doesn't kick in fast enough. And yes, this is another piece, uh, D, we've talked about technology before. Uh, the auto headlights, uh, if it's just overcast, they're not going to bring on your full lights. So yes, again, better just to turn on your headlights and your taillights and all your parking lights on. And this goes back to technology. Don't rely on blind spot detectors and other sensors on your vehicle. Make sure that you're doing your observations, you're doing your shoulder checks, you're signaling, especially when you're driving in inclement weather and you're driving in snow and ice and rain, heavy rain at night and those types of things to keep yourself safe. So know all of that talked about that and uh, Joe sent me I haven't posted this yet I need to post it over on the website Joe did uh, kind of a little semi little self experiment with night driving glasses and he really didn't find a great deal of difference with night driving glasses from not having night driving glasses I don't know a lot of people that have tried night driving glasses whether they were professional CDL drivers, Boston truck drivers, or other people. I never used them when I drove a uh, truck and I drove a lot of nights when I was driving. So I've never used night driving glasses. I mean, they might work for you and if they do work for you, then that's really great. But uh, don't have a lot of experience on uh, night driving and whatnot. <clears throat> Here, for all kinds of reasons, driving examiners are less stressed out because they don't have as many tests and those types of things. So take your driving test in the winter time. The other piece that I want to talk about in the winter time, and this is interesting, uh, is there's a video, and here I'll just show you. Uh, bear with me here while I get this over here. There we go. Okay, there's a video on Scotty's channel here. Scotty Kilmer, if you don't know who Scotty Kilmer is, he does all kinds of, you know, he's got all kinds of great opinions about the world, and uh, should you warm up your car's engine before driving? Myth busted. And I was looking at this video today, and I have one of these myself about, uh, you know, starting your car in sub-zero temperatures. And I said, you don't need to idle your vehicle for longer than it takes you to clean the snow and ice off your vehicle. And Scotty says almost the same thing. In the old days of carburetors, <laughs> you used to have to warm up the vehicle because carburetors were not that great at getting the fuel air mixture correct into the engine. And now we have fuel inject electronic fuel injection. We have just heaps of computers on our vehicles that gets all the fuel air mixture ratio almost perfect every time. So you don't need to idle your engine for longer than it takes you to clean the ice and snow off the vehicle. You get in the vehicle, you start up the engine, and the time that it takes you to clean off the ice and snow on the vehicle then you can drive the vehicle moderately. Don't drive it hard, don't rev up your engine. <laughs> As Scotty says, uh, you know, when it's cold, wait till it's up in the operating temperature and then you can, you know, drive it well and those types of things. The other piece about it, uh, Corey, actually, can you put up the new one of those? It's uh, starting your car in sub-zero temperatures. I did a remake of that video. Uh, that'd be great, thanks, Corey. So, the only thing that is warming up when you're leaving your car sitting there idling in cold weather is the engine. You're not heating up the transmission, you're not heating up the rear ends or the front end, um, 
front wheel drive mechanism in the vehicle. Nothing else in the drivetrain is being heated up. The only thing that is being heated up is the engine. So when you're driving it, the transmission's still cold, the rear end's still cold, all the other bits of the vehicle are still cold. So really, when the vehicle is sitting there idling, the only thing that you're doing is wasting fuel, polluting the environment, driving up our carbon tax, and causing premature wear to your vehicle. And the other point that was raised was oils and getting the oil through because when it's cold, the oil is really thick and won't move through the engine. That's not true anymore because all of these oils are chemically engineered that they have low viscosity, which means that they're, you know, they're more like coffee when it's super cold out and they will pump through your engine and those types of things. So basically you just have to let it idle for a couple of minutes and then you can drive it moderately. Yes, it's going to bump and bang and make all kinds of noises because everything <laughs> in that vehicle is cold. And so you need to warm it up a little bit uh, by driving it. And that way you're going to get better fuel economy and you're not going to be using as much fuel. So Get in the vehicle, start it up, have a look at these videos. It shows you how to start up your vehicle in super cold weather. And then just get the snow and ice off it and then drive it moderately. The other thing is, is that because the vehicle is still cold, the windows are going to fog up on you. So roll one of the windows down a little bit, a crack, turn on your defrost full. And, you know, use your winter windshield washer fluid to keep the ice and snow clear off the uh, glass on the outside. And if you have the option to turn on your air conditioning, uh, turn on the air conditioning in the wintertime, that helps to maintain your air conditioning. And as well, it will defrost the windows faster inside the cabin of the vehicle because the air conditioning pulls the moisture out of the, uh, the cabin of the vehicle. Now, the, uh, the last piece of that is if you're finding that your engine isn't warming up within five minutes or eight minutes of driving, uh, the thermostat in your vehicle may not be working properly. It may have gotten old and it needs to be replaced. So the thermostat, <clears throat> essentially for those of you who aren't mechanically inclined, the thermostat is in the cooling system and it's, got, it's a valve that opens when the cooling fluid gets to a certain temperature, 160 degrees Fahrenheit, 170, 180, whatever it is, whatever that specific thermostat is for. So until the engine heats up to that temperature, it will not circulate the cooling fluid uh, through the engine block and whatnot. So you get the engine will heat up faster. And it's also more economical for the engine to heat up faster because it runs at, you know, everything runs ideally once it is at that operating temperature. So if your vehicle's not warming up, then you may not need to get the thermostat fixed on your vehicle because it should five minutes, eight minutes of driving the engine should warm up for you and you should be able to drive it and have heat coming up and those types of things. The other thing that'll help you to warm your car up faster when you're driving is to leave the heat off in the cabin because it circulates the cooling fluid through uh, your heater core inside the vehicle. You know, But that's kind of a drag when you're driving in the wintertime. You want to try and get it as warm as quickly as possible uh, because it's tough. I mean, unless you have seat warmers, which is like the ultimate luxury <laughs> of driving in the wintertime. Uh, D, please bring up tires at this time of year, change of uh, temperatures and those types of things. Uh, okay, excellent. Uh, D, tires, uh, if you are changing out winter tires, most all-season tires now are going to be winter rated. They're either going to have the mud and snow symbol on them or the winter snowflake symbol on them. And you can run those through the winter time as long as you've got good tread and those types of things on them. Uh, it's really up to your personal preference about when you should put your winter tires on. I know most of the, you know, the, the rhetoric out there is, is that, you know, once the temperature gets below seven degrees Celsius, which is, you know, about 40 degrees Fahrenheit, that you should put your winter tires on. Uh, personally, I don't, I wait until the first snowfall and then I put my snow tires on because my all season tires are quality tires. And I just wait until the first snowfall be until I put my winter tires on because and the reason I do that is winter tires are a soft rubber compound. So if you're running them when it's hot outside, you're just going to do premature wear to your winter tires and they're really not serving you a purpose. So it's kind of up to you about what you're going to do and when you're going to change your tires out. Most people here where I live in the mountains have already, excuse me, 
uh, changed out their winter tires. This is kind of the busiest season. You know, October, November, people are putting their winter tires on their vehicle and getting going and prepared for winter time. So that's the other thing about all of that. Uh, D, sorry, I mean the uh, loss of pressure in the tires. Uh, D, there's not really a great deal of pressure loss in the winter time. I don't know whether you have a newer vehicle that has a uh, pressure monitoring system on it. But uh, there is some loss of pressure in the winter time. It's just a matter of topping up your tires or keeping track of that. And I mean, you can buy a tire pressure gauge inexpensive, less than $20. Uh, some of the cheaper ones at Walmart, you could even probably pick one up for 5 or $10. And then it's just a matter of monitoring the pressure in your tires. Now, there's a couple of things about tires some say to go with the vehicle's recommended pressure for your tires. Uh, I have been to numerous different tire shops. Every one of my tire shops fills my tires up to 32 PSI, pounds per square inch. And the Honda recommends 24, 25 pounds per square inch. I always run with 32 pounds in it. The tires are a little bit harder. It doesn't really seem to affect anything and it seems to be a good pressure. So if you're not really sure, consult your owner's manual, consult your automotive technician, consult the tire shop, and see what they recommend for you to put in your tires in terms of air pressure. The other piece in the winter time when it does get a bit colder, uh, lower tire pressure is going to give you a bit better traction because the tires are gonna be a bit more flexible. So there's that piece as well in terms of air pressure in your tires in the winter time and whatnot. Uh, Rena, I have another question to ask. I've seen student driver cars. Is it a good idea that they learn to drive during rush hour times or is it not? Uh, Rena, I would not in the beginning for sure. Okay, once they get a few lessons under their belt, uh, it depends where their skill level is at, what their comfort level is, and those types of things, whether they uh, you want to, as the instructor or the mentor, want to take them out into rush hour. The problem with rush hour traffic is a lot of times you're not really going very far. But as the driver becomes more comfortable, as he or she gets more skill and more confidence, then yes, you want to introduce them to that and give them some help with that so that they don't end up learning about that by themselves. But you definitely want to do that later in their learning, not at the beginning. In the beginning, you're going to be working in parking lots and low density uh, traffic areas and those types of things. Uh, Joe says uh, the Canadian Association recommends uh, no ye yellow tinted night vision glasses based on my experience with those glasses. I'm with the eye docs on that one. So uh, Joe is saying that uh, the night vision glasses didn't work out for him. Uh, Jasmine, I have to wear glasses or contacts. I have poor vision, very nearsighted. Uh, yes, bummer. Okay, elevator off to bed. Good night, my friend. And uh, Joe gave some more information about uh, the night vision glasses. Thank you for that, Joe. Uh, Jasmine, I have driven on Interstate 95 there in the United States. And Mallory, in wintertime here in the Maritimes, we get uh, nor'easters. <laughs> nor'easters, yeah, that's a good one. Uh, excellent, awesome. What else did I want to talk about? Okay, we've talked about all of that. Uh, Oil changes. The other thing about winter driving, make sure that you change the oil in your vehicles because yes, machines don't handle one of two things. Well, they don't handle two things well. They don't handle cold well. They don't like the cold. And that's why they rattle and bang in the winter time and they're gonna make noise because they don't like the cold. They also don't work well in sand. <laughs> Cause you know, little bits of sand get into everything. So, uh, you know, machines don't work well in sand, so they don't work well in snow either. Uh, not snow, but they don't work well in extreme colds. But cars, automotive technology has come so far. And this is, the again, the reason why I am encouraging you to take your driver's test in the wintertime. Cars work so well in the wintertime now, and as I said, most of them are all-wheel drive, four-wheel drive, front-wheel drive. Very few vehicles are going to be two-wheel drive, rear-wheel drive vehicles. I just is uh, <laughs> gone the way of the dodo bird uh, and the unicorn and you know a few other mythical animals that have gone away so do i do encourage you to take your driver's test in the winter time again and again and again check out uh, the smarter driver course package and that will help you out okay uh why the sticks used to be 88 cents before inflation they're probably still under a buck 40. <laughs> excellent uh, okay, 
great portable air compressor from Canadian Tire. Good thing to have. And yes, very nice to have for sure if you want if you're monitoring and checking the tire pressure on your vehicle, especially if you got bicycles and you got kids and those types of things, you know, filling up balls, soccer balls and footballs and all those things, really great to have an air compressor for sure. Uh, D, pedestrians in the wintertime, they always seem to be dressed in black. Uh, D, I am guilty of that as a pedestrian. I have a black jacket. I usually wear jeans, usually dressed in black. The only time that I am wearing high visibility reflective clothing is when I'm riding my bicycle. I'm wearing a, a yellow jacket with reflective tape on it. But as a pedestrian, I'm often wearing black clothing. <laughs> All right, uh, my friend Epic is here for night driving. Pay attention to black on orange signs uh, because during the nighttime, highway construction uh, rewards are going to happen uh, more frequently and follow work speed zones, especially in the United States. In most places, if there are workers working in construction zones at night, it's going to be twice as much for the fine that you're going to receive from the authorities. So know that as well. Uh, in terms of driving at night in construction zones. Thank you for that. Epic, my friend. Uh, Joe, another good winter help. One of those uh, portable battery chargers in case you need to boost your dead battery. And yes, and carry a survival kit. There's also a video here on survival kits for the wintertime, especially if you're driving outside of cities a lot in the wintertime and driving on highways and in country areas and those types of things. Make sure you have a survival kit. Uh, Non-perishable food. A pot and a candle to melt snow if you get stuck in the uh, snow banks and you're there for a little while make sure that you have a charging cable for your phone so you can call for help uh, if you get stranded somewhere a shovel you know traction mats for underneath the tires a lot of these survival kits you can buy inexpensive less than a hundred bucks uh, shovel uh, prescription medications if you're on prescription medications and uh, matches or lighter to light the candle uh, in your vehicle and those types of things so have all of that in your vehicle as well for winter driving 420 i've been watching your videos lately and also i take my driver's test tomorrow good luck on your driver's test tomorrow remember to breathe in through the nose out through the mouth that'll cause your body to relax and good luck on your driver's test drop back and let us know how that goes okay good luck tomorrow uh, D, if bad snow days in Ontario cancels driving tests, yes, they do. They will postpone the driving test to another day uh, when the weather clears up for sure. Uh, Rena, what do you think about the new car technology that there is some new model cars that can park by themselves? What do you think about it? Uh, Rena, I don't trust technology. I've talked about this with people. We've had discussions about it. Some people don't agree with me, and that's okay. Uh, you know, blind spot detectors, automatic parking, parallel parking. Those types of things, I don't trust technology. I like it, I love it, I think it's awesome. Uh, cars run so well in the winter time, they have so much better traction and braking systems and all of the whole technology piece of the pie. But I don't trust it, okay? I still want to be in control of my vehicle. I don't like being distracted by all kinds of, you know, uh, telematics in the vehicle and whatnot. So yes, there's all of that for sure. Uh, 420 in uh, 35 from Nova Scotia, down there in the Maritimes, down east, as we called it in Ontario. Uh, I'm not sure what they call it out here in British Columbia. Uh, when I first moved to British Columbia, there was a woman on the CBC who was being interviewed, and she said, yeah, I've been back east. I've been to Winnipeg. <laughs> and for those of you who are not familiar with Canadian geography, uh, there's Western Canada. Winnipeg is about the middle of the country, kind of, sort of. <laughs> And then there's a lot of provinces and a lot of geography east of Winnipeg, which was a hilariously funny comment. Uh, for those of you in the States, it would be like somebody in Washington State saying, oh yeah, I've been back east. Uh, I've been to North Dakota. <laughs> it's like that. Uh, Crystal, your uh, driving practice is going well. That is awesome. And Corey's put up the video for the winter survival kit. Thank you for that, Corey. That's awesome. Epic, another thing for the late night driving is drive defensively because you are going to encounter more impaired drivers and also novice drivers try to drive at night. Uh, New Jersey tried to add night driving lessons and it's unfortunate, yes, and that is would be a great thing is if some new drivers could get some help with night driving because when I was teaching truck driving, I used to take the drivers out at night and I realized quickly that their night driving skills were not at the level that they should be for learning how to drive truck because a lot of truck driving 
does in fact go on at night. So thank you for that, Corey. Uh, excellent. We're going to leave it there for tonight. Uh, if you have a driver's test coming up in the next week or so, good luck on that. Remember to breathe. That will help your body to relax. Say to yourself, I can do this. Pass your driver's test. You passed your driver's test in the last week or so. Congratulations on that. That is absolutely awesome. And good luck on your driver's test. As I said, if you're taking a driver's test, have one coming up. Do your driver's test in the wintertime. I cannot stress that enough for those of you watching now on the live stream or watching on the replay. And remember, pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. Have a great night. Bye now.